The Pacific Front. Welcome to another one of those great flipped lectures from one of your awesome history teachers. Today we're going to take a look at the Pacific Front. Be sure to write these notes in your notebook and be ready for that secret word for the prize drawing. Let's get started. The Pacific Front Learning Targets. I can describe the main battles in the Pacific Front. I can evaluate the impact of American and Japanese strategies as demonstrated through notes and discussion. Following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, Japanese forces attacked U.S. territories including Guam, Wake Island, and the Aleutian Islands near Alaska. During the winter of 1942, the Japanese went through a series of attacks throughout the Pacific which expanded their territories by capturing Hong Kong, French Indochina, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. Japan had conquered much of Asia as you can see by looking at the map and noticing that all Korean territories were Japanese. The United States, meanwhile, had to rebuild the Pacific Fleet and mobilize for war. The Philippines Japanese attention turned towards another American possession, the Philippines, between December and April of 1942. The Philippines was, um, housed the largest number of U.S. soldiers close to Japan. They began by attacking, or the Japanese began by attacking the airfields immediately following Pearl Harbor, and just two days later, Japanese invasion forces landed. 36,000 American and Filipino forces successfully held off 200,000 Japanese forces under General Douglas MacArthur for five months. When the capital of Manila was taken, MacArthur retreated to the Bataan Peninsula. They faced disease, a lack of supplies, and were outnumbered. Surrender seemed a certainty. President Roosevelt ordered MacArthur to leave as his surrender could hurt American morale. When MacArthur left, he promised, I'll be back. Japanese forces accepted the surrender of American and Filipino forces on April 9, 1942. The Japanese forced them to march 65 miles without supplies and medicine. One-fourth died along the way. This became known as the Bataan Death March. The Doolittle Air Raid President Roosevelt was looking for a way to boost American morale and show that the U.S. could fight back. Due to its distance, the Japanese flat and fleet and the situation of the American fleet, it would be difficult to bomb Japan right away. When asked to find a solution and a way to attack Japan, Lieutenant James Doolittle came up with the idea of using light, medium-range B-25 bombers. The B-25 bombers would be stripped of all non-essential weight, including things like seats and seat belts and so on. Sixteen B-52s were chosen, along with their crews of five, and they took off from the USS Hornet to bomb military targets in Japan. These B-25 bombers would be unable to land on the aircraft carriers and would instead have to land in China. So each crew member was sent with maps and notes in their shoes and also their coats that explained that they were American soldiers and allies. Eight of the crew of 30 were found by Japanese military and executed, but 22 did survive. Although the Doolittle raid did little, it was not of much strategic value. It was a morale booster to the American public, because the Americans had proven that Japan could be attacked. The Battle of Coral Sea In May 1942, the Japanese attacked Australian waters to interrupt Allied supply lines in the region. Australia was one of our closest and biggest allies. Here you can see them in the corner. And here's Coral Sea, or the entrance to it. American code breakers were able to break the Japanese code and intercepted the Japanese plans. Admiral Nimitz sent aircraft carriers to Yorktown and Lexington to meet Japanese forces. For the first time in history, a naval battle was fought by carrier-based planes alone. So instead of ships fighting ships, it's going to be the planes fighting one another. Instead of a dogfight of a single plane versus a single plane, it's going to be more like a series of swarms of planes fighting one another. While the Americans and Australians lost more ships, they defeated Japan, stopped Japanese expansion southward, and kept Allied supply lines open. It was our first big win in a battle against Japan. Battle of Midway Notice here is the island of Midway, and notice here is Hawaii. In June of 1942, General Yanomoto turned his attention to the island of Midway. Possessing Midway would allow Japan to attack, would 
would allow Japan to attack Hawaii. The attack was also designed to draw the U.S. Navy into battle. Knowledge of the Japanese code provided Americans with information about the upcoming attack. A patrol plane spotted Japanese forces approaching Midway, so Nimitz set up an ambush. This was another huge air battle between many planes coming from carriers. The Japanese fleet retreated, but U.S. planes pursued them and caused heavy damage to the Japanese fleet. Japan lost five aircraft carriers, two heavy cruisers, three destroyers, 322 planes, and 357 Japanese sailors. This became a huge turning point in the war in the Pacific because never again did Japan go on the offensive. For the rest of the war, Japan remained on the defensive, protecting territories that had previously been conquered. Island Hopping With Japan on the defensive, the United States military had to devise a plan to win the war. Japan was protected by 3,000 miles of water, in which were hundreds of fortified islands with airstrips, guns, and determined Japanese forces. Battle experience from the Battle of Tarawa helped Americans understand that taking even one of the heavily defended islands would be costly. One in three Marines were killed to take Tarawa. New strategies were needed. Work was begun on alligators, boats with trank tracks, tracks to make amphibious landings more successful, and General MacArthur decided a new policy of island hopping, where American forces would leapfrog to attack only strategically important islands to move closer to Japan. For example, islands that have airstrips or oil, that sort of thing, and the right proximity. Eventually, these islands could be used as bases to first bomb and later invade Japan. The Australians and New Zealanders, our allies in the area, would bomb the nearby islands that had been bypassed to help American forces as they leapfrog towards Japan. The secret word is Zowie. The secret word is Zowie. Guadalcanal. In August of 1942, the U.S. decided to take Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands to protect the sea link between Australia and the U.S. Marines stormed ashore, established a beachhead, and seized the airstrip the Japanese had been building. The Japanese began another assault that led to six months of fighting, including seven engagements at sea. The U.S. Marines first experienced jungle warfare, which was up close and personal hand-to-hand -hand combat due to the terrain. Um, traditional weapons don't work as well in here, and the Japanese did use some guerrilla tactics as well. Despite being short of food and equipment, the Marines eventually forced to withdraw in early 1943, and the U.S. had their first win on their first offensive. The Battle of Leyte Gulf General MacArthur had promised to return to the Philippines and make good on that promise. The Japanese army tried to block the invasion of the Philippines and destroy the American Pacific Fleet. General MacArthur's forces came from the south and Admiral Nimitz from the east. Battles were fought throughout the Philippines, including at sea. In the Battle of Leyte Gulf, 174 hundred-thousand soldiers and 738 ships converged on Leyte Gulf Island in the Philippines as part of the largest naval battle in history. In the battle, Japanese used kamikaze pilots for the first time. Kamikaze pilots are pilots who crash their planes into American ships intentionally to cause damage and are willing to kill themselves in the process. While kamikaze attacks did not affect the outcome of the war, they sank 34 naval craft, none larger than a destroyer, and damaged 358 others and stunned American forces. <coughs> At the end of the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese fleet was crushed. They lost four aircraft carriers, 13 cruisers, and almost 400 planes. However, fighting continued on the island until December. In the end, 80,000 Japanese were killed, and less than 1,000 surrendered. Americans continued to fight in the Philippines, and the Philippines were until the lib Philippines were liberated from the Japanese in July of 1945. Iwo Jima. American forces began to island hop close enough to bomb Japan directly. The island of Iwo Jima was chosen as a base to allow bombing raids on Japan and Tokyo. Tokyo was only 750 miles away from this island. The island would make a great refueling base or emergency landing field for bombers on their way to Japan. 
the Japanese turned Iwo Jima into a fortress defended by 23,000 hand-picked soldiers who vowed to fight to the death. For 74 days, Allies bombarded the island before 60,000 Marines went ashore. They landed in volcanic ash up to their ankles that allowed them to be cut in half by the artillery. 6,800 Marines lost their lives in the process of coming ashore. The fiercest fighting took place in and around Mount Saribachi. The Japanese had fortified it with miles of caves and concrete bunkers. To take the island, each cave and bunker had to be taken. Flamethrowers were used to help clear out the mountain. By March of 1945, Iwo Jima was secure. Iwo Jima was also the only battle by the U.S. Marine Corps in which American casualties exceeded Japanese, although Japanese combat deaths numbered three times the number of American deaths. 21,000 Japanese soldiers had been killed, and only 200 were taken prisoner. The ferocity of the fighting in Iwo Jima represented the Japanese belief in Bushido, no surrender. The belief of fighting and continuing to fight despite the odds to support your country. Okinawa Americans wanted the airfields on the island of Okinawa as they would help with the invasion of Japan and allow both long-range and short-range bombing on Japan as it was only 350 miles from the nation. The battle for Okinawa would become the Pacific Front's largest amphibious operation. It began in April of 1945, and within three weeks the U.S. held four-fifths of the island. The Japanese continued to resist until June 21st. Japanese forces pulled into the mountains, which led to harsh fighting uphill against machine gun fire. During the battle, 1,500 kamikaze attacks were used. Kamikaze attacks were now official weapons of war in Japan. Japan had even created a kamikaze corps, and recruited volunteers. At the end, 12,000 American lives were lost, while the Japanese lost 100,000. Many committed suicide to avoid capture. The door to Japan was now open, but the costs were not going to be weighed. Many people estimated that it would take anywhere between half a million to a million casualties to invade Japan proper. Fire bombings of Tokyo all that remained was a decision on how to end the war with Japan. Should the Allies bomb Japan or invade Japan directly? The high losses in Okinawa and Iwo Jima convinced the American military that a land invasion would be too costly. Major General Curtis LeMay took command of the bombing campaign against Japan. He studied British area bombing tactics and adopted them to force Japan to surrender. The U.S. began firebombing Tokyo. Napalm was used. Napalm is a jelly gas that um, spreads out and then ignites when the bomb goes. At first they targeted war industries, but later civilian areas were also targeted. In the end, 80,000 civilians died, one-fourth of the city of Tokyo was leveled, and 250,000 buildings were destroyed. These tactics were repeated in 67 cities across Japan. By the end of July of 1945, Almost half of Tokyo had been destroyed, and many Japanese cities had already been leveled by all of this strategic bombing. And yet, the Japanese still did not surrender. The next question would be, how do we win this war? 